searching for life again. I grew up in a small town in South Louisiana. Grew up in a family of five girls. My dad desperately wanted a son. Desperately wanted a son. I'm searching for real again. I turned 18 and joined the Army and met my husband in the military. I only did my obligation and then followed him as a spouse in the military. In 2003, Iraq, of course, started and he was in and out of a war zone for probably about 13 years. I'm searching for love. During that time, four years before my husband left for Iraq, my mom's sister, who was like an aunt to me, and it's such a spirit-filled woman. 99, she was battling breast cancer. In 2000, she succumbed to her cancer. I had a four-year-old daughter that she had to see this. I couldn't leave her nowhere. I had to take her with me because we're military. We were stationed in Fort Polk, and I had to take my father to the VA. And Monday morning, I took him, and his little doctor said, it's cancer. And I started to cry, and he stopped. He looked at me, he said, what are you crying for? He said, dry your eyes. The type of cancer he had was mesothelioma. So within 24 hours, I lost an aunt. And here it is, my dad told he's gonna live six months. Three years into his diagnosis, I went home for the 4th of July. And we were all hanging out, and my little sister was sick. And so we went to the emergency room, and the little doctor said, you know, she's retaining water and doing a CAT scan. He said, I'm sorry, she has tumors throughout her liver. She was 22, her child was three, and that was Jamarius. She got to spend her last Christmas with her baby. In March, she succumbed to it. And my husband left for Iraq war two days later. And I came from a family of faith, a family that seen hardship, a family that knew what it's like not to have food in the freezer. I was probably about 26, and my mom said on the way to the emergency room before she passed, she looked at my mom and she said, Mama, why me? Why me? And my mom's response to it was, God is not making a mistake. And just keep trusting him. I thought, God, is making a mistake. Like, why are you hurting the people that love you, they do good by people, they share your word, they live your word? For the first time in my life, I experienced a depression that I didn't understand. Anger, I hated God, I, not hate, I just thought all this that I believe, how could you do this? After she died, the whole community, my whole family, Jamarius became like everybody's baby. He always wiggled when he was little, so we called him Wiggy. My father and my mom raised him. He was just a beautiful kid. He was a beautiful soul. My dad never had a son. So Jamarius was his world. After my dad passed, it was tough on Jamarius. And then not even a year later, my dad's brother passed. And then two years after that, my dad's nephew, who was like a, a huge mentor to him, passed. And he just told my mom, he said, Mama, I gotta leave. I wanna go see the mountains in California. And he left. Sometime throughout the night, my mom was so concerned, she was following him on his phone. My sister's a police officer and she's head of dispatch. My mom called my sister, she said, you still at work? She said, I've been tracking him, but he stopped. And it's not like Jamari is not to answer me or call me or text me. And so my sister said, well, let me call. There were seven highway patrol areas. And the first one she picked, the guy answered the phone. He said, that's funny, you would call. He said, I just worked an accident with an unidentified young black male, a good Samaritan, and pulled him out the car. 
and he said he was flown to a hospital, the local trauma center, the closest to us at the time was Loma Melinda. And my mom was sent right to the emergency room. It was hard for her to believe that she had to bury her child, and now she's about to bury her child's child. Even though I had was angry at God in 2003 to probably about 2005. When I say angry, I was angry. When I say hurt, I was hurt. My husband got hurt in Afghanistan, and I got the knock on the door, like you see in the movies and stuff, and he got hurt really bad, and he was in a Saudi hospital. After he got better, everything seemed like for a little while it was going fine. My best friend, my only friend, best friend at the time, took her life. She was a Air Force veteran. I still can't believe it. And my little sister is 35. She's the baby baby of the group and she gets sick. And she starts to get the same nauseated feeling that my other sister had. It was such a aggressive cancer. And the doctor told her that if she would have waited one week, the cancer would have spread so rapidly that she would have had at, at the most four months to live. So talk about faith. We got together, we all prayed, got her through it. She got through it, she's incredible, she's strong. And it's been said that when you experience certain things, sometimes the only place you find yourself is on your knees. And it was around 2007 that I fell on my knees. I apologized and repented to God for being so angry and so hurt and from walking away from him for so long. I just started really, really dedicating a big portion of my life to God and living godly, not just reading scripture. About a year later, we moved to Northern Virginia area. I'm a dental assistant. The doctor I was working with, Dr. Willis, he's quiet. I was talking to a patient. She's kind of rude, but I, I interpreted it as rude. And I said, ma'am, I'll give you a few minutes. And she looked at me and she said, I just been diagnosed with cancer. And just the word kind of just shook me in my core. I was like, can I give you a hug? And I tried to quote some scripture. I'm not good at quoting scripture. Dr. Willis was passing behind me going to lunch and he heard me and he stopped. He came back in, printed out the scripture the right way and he put the scripture next to me and he said, I'm not gonna let you mess up the Lord's word like that. <laughs> and so him and I became spiritual friends. And right before Jamaris died, Dr. Willis texted me and he said, hey, he said, if you don't mind, I had to call him like, hey, what did we fly? I, I have no clue. It's just a panic situation. And he told me, Ontario. And he said, do you mind if I pass your information along to some of my friends? And I said, if they could just pray for us, that would be, a, that would be more than enough. Because that encounter with Dr. Willis and him and I having conversations, and God could have designed for my little nephew to die at any mile marker on that highway. It was 30 minutes outside of Loma Linda. And so for me, I know that God is intentional. Jamorius was an organ donor. From what we were told from the legacy program, he impacted over 200 lives. In fact, one of the recipients to his kidneys and his pancreas was on his deathbed, and he had to have both. And it's rare that you could get both. He wants to meet with me, and I thought for, for a little while, I told my sister, I say, I don't think I'm ready for that. And the Spirit of God laid it on my heart to say, maybe he needs to say thank you to a family member for receiving life. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But with all the tragedies that we've gone through, biggest part of that scripture that stands out to me is the part that says hope. 
You have to hope that there's something better on the other side. And God said, just the faith of a mustard seed is enough. I want to thank Adrian for her courage in sharing her story. Adrian is here with us this morning from Louisiana. Welcome. In this series, we've been looking at objections to the existence of God and trying to find credible reasons to believe. Two weeks ago, I shared with you the quote from a very outspoken atheist by the name of Christopher Hitchens. He's part of a group known as the Four Horsemen of the New Atheism. The quote was when he was asked, what's the hardest argument for you to deal with from the other side? And Hitchens said, it's the fine-tuning argument, the reality that the universe, our globe, is so delicately fine-tuned that the odds that it just happened are astronomical, unthinkable. He said, that's the hardest argument. In the spirit of candor and honesty, I will tell you that from my side, from one who seeks to defend God, today's topic is the hardest one. A loving God and human suffering. A God who cares for us and Adrian's story, your story. Now, it's not a new question. We've been asking it for a very long time. Many Bible scholars believe that the first book in the Bible to actually be written was the book of Job. Not all agree. But even those who don't agree will tell you the book of Job is a very ancient book, which tells us that from the dawn of our experience, we've been asking that question. Not only does Job ask it, but many biblical personalities and writers thereafter continue to press the question home. It continues to echo in our day and time. It's shouted by scoffers and skeptics. It's wailed by mockers and mourners. It's whispered by believers and followers. But we keep asking, how can there be a God of love in the presence of human suffering. And let me be very clear. This is not a theoretical discussion. This reality deals with the lives and the souls of people. We cannot talk about this as some dry academic debate. We talk about it only with tears in our eyes and with lumps in our throats. It's very real. So the first thing we have to say is, if anybody gives quick or tried answers, don't trust them. This deserves far deeper treatment. In fact, the first thing we have to learn is to have the humility enough to say about so many things related to this topic, I don't know. I simply don't know. But I do want to suggest to you today that maybe there are some ways we can begin to get our mind around God and human suffering. In fact, I'd like to offer you four words to consider, four simple words, as a way of beginning to think about how we come to terms with this in our lives. Four words. The first word is the word freedom. Freedom. 
It doesn't take reading but three chapters of Genesis to start asking the question, God, why did you why did you wire Adam and Eve in a way? Why did you give them the ability to make choices? Just take that away. We wouldn't have been in this whole mess. Except for the fact that God values freedom. Human freedom. Apparently, God more deeply values interacting with beings that are thoughtful and have the capacity to even choose against him rather than those who are his puppets, his captives, his robots, but always obedient. I want to read you one verse from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. It comes right on the boundaries of the promised land. Moses speaks it to his people. It is about that specific situation and context, but in all honesty, it's a text that could be waved as a banner over the whole biblical narrative because it's what we're called to do. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. This is Moses. He says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Moses is underlining the fact that God has given us the freedom to decide, the freedom to choose, and he's imploring his people, choose life. Choose God's way. Freedom. Imagine that you're a new parent. You, you stand or you lie in the bed of the OB ward, cradling in your arms that precious bundle of life. You, in that moment, know love in a way you have never known it before. But as you cradle that baby to your bosom, you are also keenly aware not only of your love and the frailty and vulnerability of this new life, you are also aware, aware that just outside of the doors of this hospital lurks a dangerous world a world that is filled with violence and evil and hatred and racism and bigotry and every other evil you can imagine, you are aware that the world into which your child will one day step is a dangerous world. Yes, it has its beauty, but underneath that beauty is fear. So you have to make a choice. I want to suggest you have two choices. Choice number one is you protect that child. You build barriers and boundaries around that child. Throughout the years of that child's life, as that child grows up, you continue to reinforce and strengthen those barriers and boundaries. You severely limit the choices they make. You don't allow them to be exposed to evil. You don't allow certain people in the house. You keep them at home. You don't let them get out there where all the danger lies. And by the time your child is a full adult, by the time your child has reached midlife, you have a safe child ensconced inside of of this protected fortress you have constructed around them. Angry, bitter, hard, but safe. Second choice. As that child begins to grow, as soon as you're able to, you begin to disciple that child, to pour into his or her life. From a very early age, you help them understand what danger is and to make wise choices. As they grow, you help them understand that every choice has a consequence. You say, be thoughtful about people. Don't just trust everyone, but give people a chance. You guide them. You form them. You interact with them. And every year that passes, you open the door to freedom just a little bit wider. By the time that child reaches adulthood, by the time that child reaches middle age, you know what you'll have on your hands? You'll have a person who is able to live a healthy life and who can choose to live a moral life, may still take risks, wants to go to another part of the world, a dangerous part of the world, and help some of the world's most unfortunate people. You want to shield them and protect them but that's their choice, so you respect it. Or it could be the opposite. 
That child makes the decision to turn his back, to turn her back on everything that they've been taught and to go in a deadly direction. And all you can do is hope and weep and pray. But what you have in this case is a free moral agent. God must value that profoundly because God gave us freedom. That's the first word. First word for us to consider. But there's a second word. This is the word conflict. Conflict. You read from Genesis to Revelation in this book and you realize there's a cosmic conflict unfolding and we are caught in the crossfire. There's a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual war zone. There are many passages to which we could turn. I'm going to read just one of them to you. It's from Paul's pen as he wrote the letter to the Ephesians. This is one way that cosmic conflict is captured. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Paul is saying, we're in a battle. There's a war that's going on. What you can expect in a war is there will be damage, there will be injury, there will be death. That's the appropriate expectation. It's not cheerful to consider. We're not happy to think about it. But it's true. As long as we're in that battle zone, this fractured planet called Earth, that will be true. Right now, for those of you who are sports fans, is football training camp. Around this country, there are football players, some 2,000 of them, trying to make football teams get ready for the season. Football's a rough sport. Those who play it at times call it war. They call it battle. It's a physical sport. As such, there are injuries. There are already injuries now. During training camp, we haven't even made it to the season. Seasons have ended. For players who had all kinds of hope, they won't be touching the field this season. I got to thinking about that this week, and I thought, you know, there's something I have not heard or read. Over the years, I've followed sports blogs. I've, I've listened to coaches and players at their press conferences. I've, Listen when I get a chance to sports talk radio. And I don't believe I've ever heard, at least I could not remember it, I don't believe I've ever heard after a devastating injury to a star player on a team, I haven't heard that player or a coach stand at the podium at the press conference and ask the question, why? Why did God allow this to happen? And I got to thinking about that. I think the reason may be is that there is an expectation. We're on the field. We're in battle. Injuries occur. It's not a cheerful thought. But there's truth in it. So what immediately follows next then is the question. Well, wait a minute. Read the Bible. Read the ministry of Jesus. He went around healing. Miracles seem to have been an everyday occurrence. In fact, Ellen White makes the statement that there were entire villages where there was not a moan of sickness because Jesus had passed through and healed them all. And so our question becomes, then why don't you do that now? Why don't we see that all the time now? God does do what God does at times. No question about that. And when the story ends well, I join you in celebration. But the story doesn't end well nearly often enough. So maybe we need to read Scripture more carefully. May I remind you of something? You remember this. That when it comes to the miraculous in this book, miracles primarily, not exclusively, miracles primarily occur in three periods of time, clusters, three clusters of time. 
And the miracles serve as God waving a banner saying, hey, 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 look over here. I'm about to do something new and different. And the miracles serve to catch the attention of the world to what God is doing. It happens around the time of Moses in the Exodus, around the time of Elisha and Elisha the prophets, and around the time of Jesus in the early church. There are other times when decades, even hundreds of years, can flash by of the biblical narrative, flash by the window when there's nothing miraculous. It's a war zone. What are we to make of that? Maybe part of what we make of it is that God isn't a helicopter parent running around behind cleaning up every mess we make. So that's the second word. First word, freedom. Second word, conflict. And then the third word, Calvary. Calvary. Calvary, that mountain from which Jesus preached his most eloquent sermon on love. Calvary, that mountain he struggled up under the burden of the cross. Calvary, that place where the Son of God hung suspended between heaven and earth because heaven would not claim him and earth did not want him. Calvary, that place. There may be no better passage in Scripture to underline what happened there than the one that was read this morning as our scripture reading by Harrison Mays and Brittany Austin. Powerful passage penned by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. It says this again. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. When we look at, at Calvary, we see God's most eloquent statement that says, I will not allow you to go through anything that I myself am immune to. I will pull aside the curtain of time. I will step into time. I will wrap myself in human flesh, and I will be, as Paul said, obedient to death, even death on a cross. What that says is Jesus understands. He is by your side. He knows what it is to be mocked and ridiculed. He knows what it is to be profoundly disappointed. He knows what it is to stand at the tomb of a friend. He knows what it is to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you cry that out in the darkness of your night, your dark night of the soul, you are merely echoing the words of Jesus himself. He is with you. No matter how dark the night, the late and, in my view, great John Stott, one of the preeminent Bible scholars of the 20th century, said it this way, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I have entered many temples in different countries around the world and stood respectfully before the statue contained therein. In each case, the figure depicted is detached from the agonies of the world. So each time after a while, I've had to turn away. And in imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his humanity to 
It is immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross that symbolizes divine suffering. The cross of Christ is God's only self-justification in such a world as ours. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Calvary. In wrestling with the question of a good God in the presence of suffering, we cannot engage that discussion without Calvary being front and center, the ultimate self-revelation of God. And yet sometimes we have misunderstood it. We've misunderstood not only what's happening at Calvary, but God's heart in total. Historically, one of the key moments where that was true took place on July 8, 1741, in Northampton, Massachusetts. That was the day that a pastor preached a sermon to his own congregation. The pastor's name was Jonathan Edwards. Edwards was a an unusually bright mind, articulate, had accomplished great things with a stellar education, a teacher, a preacher, an author, a philosopher. In fact, he's been called the father of American evangelicalism. That day, July 8, 1741, Edwards would preach a sermon that would become a spark that would help to ignite a revival called the Great Awakening. And yet, one wonders, was it the right spark? Because the sermon Edwards preached was a sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He was, by all accounts at that point, a bit of an older man, a bit feeble. He preached from a manuscript, the manuscript laid on the lectern before him, from which he read word for word, just moving through by rote, seldom raising his eyes to the listeners. But the images which Edwards described were so vile, so stark, that in the pews, people were moaning and weeping, shouting out in repentance, falling to their knees in repentance, because what Edwards described was God enjoying, relishing, holding people over the fires of hell. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Is that what we see at Calvary? Or do we not see something markedly different? Because when we look at Calvary, what we don't see is is the fear of sinners in the hands of an angry God. What we do see is the love of a God in the hands of angry sinners. We see a God who has surrendered himself to whatever torture evil can inflict upon him to go to the depths of suffering so that no matter how dark your night gets, he's already been there. No matter how deep your life falls, he's already been there. No matter how piercing your pain is, he's already been there. When he got there, he broke the tomb. Just broke it. So that he not only revealed, he redeemed. So any discussion of God and human suffering must include Calvary. I don't know the answer. I I can't solve for you that quandary. But I can offer you four words for consideration. Freedom, conflict, Calvary. And finally, the word presence. Presence. One of the definitions that dictionary.com gives to the word presence is 
immediate proximity. Presence is immediate proximity. Means with you, beside you, among us. That's presence. We often ask the question, why doesn't God do something about suffering now? And what is God going to do about suffering tomorrow? Well, the truth is, God has done something about suffering now. His presence is with us. I want to read to you a verse. We've probably read it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. I don't know. But I want to tease out one implication of that verse today. It's in Paul's first letter to the church in ancient Corinth. Do you remember this verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 27? Writing to the church, he says, All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. In other words, this gathering right here today is one expression of the body of Christ on earth. This is how God is present among us, Christ's body. And you get to looking around, and you say, mercy, God's in trouble. <laughs> this reminds me, do you remember Dorothy Sayers, English writer? She says, God has experienced three great humiliations, three great humiliations. For God's first great humiliation is the manger, God incarnate, the ineffable God wrapping himself in human flesh. That's the first humiliation, says Sayers. Second great humiliation, says Sayers, is the cross, Christ's death. And the third great humiliation, the church. It's you and me. God's great humiliation, says Sayers. Because for whatever reason, reasons which I cannot explain to you, Christ has chosen for this given period of time to be present in the world in a primary way, and that's us. Humiliating, amen. Biblical, absolutely. Do you understand what that means? That means that when your neighbors, your neighboring couple loses a child to SIDS, when you have a colleague at work whose son is killed by a drunk driver, when a professor at the class you're attending receives a grim diagnosis with a worse prognosis, when that happens, the likelihood is that they are feeling abandoned by God. Abandoned. Forgive me for pointing out the obvious, but the best answer to abandonment is presence. The best answer to a feeling of abandonment is the reality of someone's presence. So, what am I doing? What are you doing about suffering in our world? Jesus has chosen to limit himself to his body. I don't know why. Sayers would say that's humiliating, but it's real. God has done something about suffering. He's placed us in the world so that we can incarnate the presence of God to those who suffer. Talking with my good friend Carl Hafner this week, talking about this theme, and Carl pointed me to a tweet, tweeted out by Rick Warren. Rick Warren, founding pastor, Saddleback Community Church down the road from us in Orange County. Rick and Kay experienced the horrific suicide of their son. 
And I suspect it was in grappling with the realities that grew out of that that Rick tweeted out something that says maybe as succinctly, as simply, and in truth, in your face, as could possibly be said, this reality. Here's his tweet. When people are in deep pain, they don't need explanations, advice, encouragement, or even Scripture. They just need you to show up and shut up. Just be with them. It's the healing ministry of presence. I mean, how much more? Just show up and shut up. I can even do that. And if I can do it, maybe you can. Show up, shut up. I'm here. And in your mind, you say, Jesus, thank you for the unbelievable privilege of incarnating your presence to this suffering friend. God, why don't you do about something about suffering now? We're tempted to ask that question. Philip Yancey says, better not ask that because he might say, why don't you? That's my plan. You are my plan A and B, C, and D. He has done something. But then what about tomorrow? What will God do about suffering tomorrow? There is no better text in my mind in the Scriptures than one I have had the sacred privilege of reading many times at funerals for friends. John the Revelator's words, the penultimate chapter of Scripture. Listen to what he scratches onto parchment. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. You know what that's called? Presence. God among us, God with us, presence. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will pull his crusty handkerchief out of his pocket. And wipe every tear. From their eyes. There will be no more death. Or mourning. Or crying. Or pain. For the. Old order of things has passed away. You know how? because he's present with us. He who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's what God's going to do tomorrow. He's doing something today with his presence that he has chosen to have reside in us. And he'll do something tomorrow with his presence, immediate proximity. So when somebody asks you, how can there be a good God with so much suffering? Friends, don't argue. Ever. I don't know that I've ever met a person angry at God for whom it it wasn't true that if you followed that path of pain to the trailhead, you would find abandonment and disappointment. So be the presence of Jesus. Love them. Care, show up, shut up. Pretty simple. Take it seriously and incarnate the presence of Jesus. And how do we do that? In this series, we've agreed that we're going to follow the ethic of Peter. So I'm going to ask you if you would stand with me.
as we read our North Star passage, our guiding passage for this series, as the guys put it up on the screen, we're going to read this aloud together. Ready? Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Gracious God, make us that kind of people. Let us weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. And give us a bright and living hope in our own hearts. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.